Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we're not alone and that you give us a community that can surround us and help us and pray for us. God, I ask that uh, as we're gathered here in worship, that your spirit would dwell with us that it would open our hearts and our minds so that as the scriptures are read and the words are proclaimed in the sermon, or that we may be able to hear what you have for us today. And so I ask that they, the words that I speak are not my words, but your words. And that through our worship together, you would be given all glory and honor. We pray this in your name, Christ. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Mark. Remember, we're going through the Gospel of Mark. And so we get to this story at the beginning of chapter 2. Listen now to the word of the Lord. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say? To this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We've never seen anything like this. Jesus had been doing some incredible things, but what he just did here has astonished everyone. Last week, Ted talked about the proclamation that Jesus makes of God's kingdom being here and now. And so after that proclamation, until we get to chapter 2, Jesus has been doing some really cool things. He's been going around in towns, and he's been casting out evil spirits. He's been meeting a whole bunch of different people and healing them. We even have this story where he goes and he meets a leopard. Now remember, leopards are the people that had to stay out unclean and everyone would like run away from them. They had their own space outside of normal society that they have to live. Jesus comes up and heals the leper and welcomes him back in to community. And so what is happening? Everyone's hearing about Jesus and he's starting to get swarmed. And so that's where we pick up our story is Jesus in his home. And so uh, we've got this guy who's paralytic. Why does this not work? (laughs) (laughs) It it was on. It should have worked. So we've got Jesus, and he tells this paralytic... As he's getting lowered, your sins are forgiven. And as he does this, everyone is astonished by what he has just said. Now you see, um, 
it should have been maybe a little surprising, but not too surprising for the Jewish people. Because in the Jewish custom, there always seemed to be this tie together of sins being forgiven, and after sins are forgiven, there's this healing that takes place. But I can I can't say with certainty because I wasn't one of the four. But if I was one of the four, I know that as I brought my friend and I lowered him down through this roof, I wouldn't be expecting to hear your sins are forgiven. I would be hoping that he would have done everything else. You, you can get up, you can walk, you're, you're healed that we've seen from all of these other stories. And in fact, I mean, I don't think too many people would have thought that Jesus was saying your sins are forgiven. And we can see that from the reaction that takes place. You see, only God alone can forgive sins. And so we've got these legal experts who start talking amongst themselves, and they even go as far as saying that he's blaspheming. Now, this is because the normal process of forgiving sins would have been to go to a temple, you have some sacrifices, the priest is there, and then the forgiveness of sins happens. But we have Jesus here and now making this claim saying that your sins are forgiven, so that there is no doubt in anyone's mind that he is claiming to be God, which you don't really see up till this point in the Gospel of Mark. And so we have this claim. He is saying, I am God. I can forgive sins. And so that you know this will happen, he then does this miracle of this guy getting up in front of everyone, taking his mat, and he gets to walk back into society. And so that is an awesome and great thing that we see. But what also struck me as I was thinking of this story is the power of God that we see in community. And so this morning, I want to share some stories with you, some of our Bible stories, and then some other stories about God in community. And so when we go to our first story, it's the story of our... No, go back to the other one. Um, it's the story of the paralytic man. And so I want you to imagine with me a little bit as we think about this story. Imagine that you were one of the four friends in this story. So you've got this friend. You've been hearing about this guy, Jesus. He's been doing all these miracles. And you say, hey, you know what? I've got this friend that needs healing. Why don't I help him out? And so you gather some of your buddies, and the four of you start carrying him I don't know how long it would have been, but some distance to Jesus because you found out Jesus is home. And so as you get closer, this might be where you start getting discouraged because you realize, hey, I'm not the only one with this idea because you see Jesus' house is just packed. And as I imagine this, I'm thinking it might be a little bit like if you had gotten to go down to the Penguins Victory Parade and there was all those people and you're like, holy cow, like there is way more people here. And so instead of getting discouraged, You've got a friend that says, hey, I've got an idea. Why don't we just go through the roof? And instead of looking at this friend with like cross eyes, like, what are you talking about? They say, hey, we're going to go and we're going to do this. And so they get up on the roof and with their hands, they start tearing it open and they lower Jesus down. And as they lower Jesus down, Jesus tells them that his sins are forgiven and then heals this man, and he says that it's the friend's faith that has helped to heal this guy. Our next story is that of the prophet Elijah. So in 1 Kings chapter 17, we've got this really cool story that takes place. See, there's been a drought in the land that's actually caused by God um, through Elijah praying for it because he wants to show his power over creation. And so Elijah had been fed by some ravens. And as he was fed by these ravens, he was all good. But then God goes, okay, I'm going to test you with another thing. And so he sends him to this foreign city. And as he gets into the foreign city, Elijah's pretty much told, hey, I've got to have you go up to this widow and this person you meet and ask for food. And so he goes up and he starts hearing about the widow and realizes she's got these sticks in her hand and they have this exchange back and forth, and we find out that this widow is gathering these sticks so she can go home and bake her last meal for her and her son before she dies. And if I'm Elijah at this point, I'm thinking, what? Like, God, why are you sending me to this widow? 
And if we think of widows, we realize that it's widows that are talked about in Scripture that we need to take care of because widows don't even have that much. And let alone, you're bringing me to a widow who's ready to make her last meal and die? And sure enough, as the story continues, the widow makes the sacrifice of the last meal so Elijah can have food and welcomes Elijah into their home. And Elijah says, there's going to be this promise if you do this, You're going to be able to eat, and sure enough, God allows the flour jar that she has and the bottle of oil to not run out. And so they get to keep having meal after meal. The story doesn't end there. The son of the widow becomes sick, and as she becomes sick, or as he becomes sick, he ends up dying. And so then you've got this widow who's just super angry with Elijah at this point in time. Why did you come to my home man of God, to reveal my sin so that my son would die. Well, Elijah says, this can't happen. And so he goes up and he starts pleading with God, God, why did you do this evil thing and take away this son? Bring back his life. And so God hears Elijah's plea to bring back this son, and the son is made alive again. And then we have this response from the widow that she realizes that Elijah is a man who speaks for God. The next story I wanted to look at is not a Bible story, but uh, out out of the mouths of babes. I I don't know who said it during the children's sermon, Um, but you guys know Ryan Shazier. He's a linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He had the injury that happened this season where he was uh, paralyzed so that he wasn't able to walk. Um, A few weeks ago, he was able to be with his teammates at a practice, and I'm going to see if I can read it because I made this way too small, Um, but he posted this picture on Instagram, and it's him in a wheelchair at the practice facility, and what he says is just incredible. He says, I want to thank the Lord for the first downs that he has been allowing me to achieve. The touchdown is going to come in his timing, but today was a first down. I was finally able to make it to practice with my teammates. It's great to be back for practices and meetings, just to be able to get back. I've been making strides over the past month and continue to make progress, taking it day by day, but I'm far from done. The Lord has not finished his work yet. I want to thank you, the fans in Steelers Nations, for your prayers. If it wasn't for my family, friends, and your prayers, I wouldn't be where I am now. They have lifted me and my family through this journey, and I ask for you to continue praying for me as I continue to work daily on improving my health. And so we can see through these statements that it's the community that surrounded him in the midst of this tragedy that has helped him. He's realized that there's power in prayer as it's God in this prayer that God has been answering that has helped him to make the strides thus far. This community has also helped him to realize that everything is done in God's timing. And so he's trusting the process and trusting what God is doing. And so this community has helped him to see God more fully and experience God during this tragedy. The last one I'm going to share with is a a personal story, and it's that of a friend who helped me. Um, So when I was in college, I had a friend named Brian Rossman. We lived in a suite together, and it was about the middle of the semester, about that time where you've got your uh, exams and midterm papers that are due. And I might have procrastinated a little bit, but I had done some work towards this paper that was due, or at least the research side of things. And so I just thought, okay, I'm going to sit down the day before it's due, and I'm going to write the whole thing out. But I had given myself some time. And so in the afternoon, I started my paper, and I just had this writer's block. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to say in this story, in this paper. And and so I continued, and I thought, okay, maybe as the afternoon had gone by and I hadn't gotten anywhere, Okay, I'm just going to go to dinner, I'm going to clear my head, I'll come back from dinner, and surely I'm going to be over this writer's block, because this doesn't normally happen. And so I go to dinner, I come back from dinner, I sit down, and it's like I'm watching the clock as it's getting later, and later, and still later, and I've got like nothing on this paper yet. 
And so I am getting more stressed out and more stressed out as I watch the clock tick on. And so I go into my uh, sweet room and I'm trying to like pray and trying to like get myself out of this writer's block. And my sweet mate comes in and he asks the question of how I was doing. He, he could probably tell that something was going on. And instead of giving him like the okay sort of answer that we give people that you walk by on the street, I decided, okay, I'm just going to tell him what's going on. Now, Brian had been getting ready for bed because he needed to be up and at school at 6.30 a.m. because he was in the middle of his student teaching. Instead of going to bed, though, he decided he wanted to sit with me until we got this paper done. And so he sat with me this whole time. He helped me to outline it. I was able to talk to someone, and I get to the end of the paper, and it is 2.30 in the morning. And so uh, this has sat with me ever since then because I needed to see God's presence. I needed to feel God's presence, and God sent me Brian. And so what I learned from that story is that we're never alone. God provides people in our life who can be with us during those times of struggle. And so as we looked at those four stories, I think we learned some stuff from those stories. If we go to our next slide. We see that instead of just healing and support, which is common to all of these stories, we see that God reveals himself and community to those that are open to it. And so as we get this story in Mark, we've kind of got this playful interaction that happens. We've got these people who are astonished and amazed and see God in a new way. But we also have these scribes, these experts of the law, that are taken back. So instead of seeing what God is doing, they decide to be like, wait a second, uh, he can't say that. He can't say that he forgave the sins because only God can forgive the sins. And if only God can forgive the sins, then he's blaspheming. And they're like working themselves and going through all these things in their head. And so then Jesus says to them, and so the whole crowd can see this, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and take your mat and walk. And so he makes this proclamation that everyone else gets in the crowd except for these people that are confused, that he is God and he can forgive sins, and then heals this guy who gets to walk back and be part of community now. In Elijah's story, what we see is two people. We have this widow who's a foreigner who's willing to welcome in a stranger and Elijah and feed him. And then we have Elijah who's willing to uh, interact and pray for the son. And as they're together and their actions happen, God is known in a new and a full way in that story. And it's this realization that I realized that it's our actions and what we do in being open that allows us to see God. And it struck me, there's a verse in John that talks about how people will know we are Christians by our love. And so as we're in community and we have this community of love going on, people get to see God, at least those that are open to seeing God. And so we get to the next truth that I learned. And that's what we see in these stories is this idea of whatever it takes. So you have these friends who have decided, okay, we're going to carry the paralytic, all the way to the house. And when they get there, they could have turned around. They could have said, well, today's maybe not the day. But they decide, no, we're going to keep going on. We're going to keep making the sacrifice of our time so our friend can be healed. And so they tear open the roof. And when they tear open the roof, Jesus isn't upset that they've just torn a hole in his roof, but he realizes the faith these friends have and the sacrifices that they've made. Or you look at the widow who makes the sacrifice of her last meal. Or Elijah who won't take the death of her, or the death of the widow's son. And he pleads with God. He makes the sacrifices. She makes the sacrifices. They get to see that he's a man of God. And there's this new relationship, this new revelation. Then there's Brian who decides, hey, I'm not going to go to sleep tonight until you are through your problem. And because of that, forever changed my view of how God meets us and the community that we're surrounded by. And so we see that as we are willing 
to put others first, we're willing to make that sacrifice, God does some pretty cool things. We have two ministries at this church that I think some people know about, but not everyone knows about. And both of these ministries were embraced by Sue Donahue, who is the the deacon that just passed away. She's completed her baptism. And so I thought it would only be fitting now to let everyone know about these. Um, She was in charge of the care letters. So after this service, if you went over to the information table, we send out these letters to people so that they know that the church is thinking about them and praying for them, and they get this tangible reminder that they're not alone in that struggle. The other ministry, and I didn't actually get to see it myself, unfortunately, but Ted was telling me about it when we had gotten to visit Sue one time, is she had like this prayer room in her house. And so as things went over the prayer chain, she would get it and she would put it up and she would constantly be praying for people. And so it doesn't take that long. You can be on the prayer chain. You can see what's going on. You can spend some time praying for one another. And it really does some impactful things as God is answering those prayers in this community. Now, I realized as I was thinking of this idea of prayer and healing that there's this passage from James that I almost was going to paraphrase, but I wanted to let the words speak for themselves. So now I want you to look at James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. It says, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray to each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from their error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And so we get to this last thing, and we realize, and even it was talked about in our children's sermon this morning, healing doesn't always happen in the way that we're hoping or expecting it would. But there is a promise. It's this promise of holistic healing that God will do. And we see from Ryan Shazier, you know, he may never walk. He may walk again. We have no idea. But we can see that God has helped lift up his spirit, has given him hope, for a future, and there was this healing that has already started to take place in him. There's a book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer called The Life Together, and it talks about, it actually says, the classic explorations of Christian community, and it's this wonderful, wonderful book. And in this book, he talks about this idea of a community of love, this place where we carry each other's burdens rather than letting our sisters and brothers feel like they're alone. And so it's a place where you can be yourself, where you can be supported, where you can be open and honest. And even one of the ways that we see this kind of open honesty take place is this idea of confessing sins to your brother or sister that he suggests in this book. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, and I don't really know how much I want to do something like this, But he suggests that you do this. And when they do this in this community, they realize that they're accepted rather than the sin that they're weighing them down and causing them to feel in prison. But as they confess their sin to their brother and their sister, the weight is lifted and they're embraced by that brother or sister. And then they're helped in life. Instead of getting pushed away from society, they're embraced into society. And so we see this holistic healing happen when you're in that sort of thing. In life we're going to experience loss, we're going to experience times of darkness, and we're going to experience struggle. But when we're in community with each other, looking to carry one another's burdens, we can bring hope in that time of loss, we can bring light to that time of darkness, and we can help give strength to make it through that struggle. And so my hope for you is that as you go from here, 
you would get to be part of that community. You would want to carry each other's burdens so that you can see God's power revealed as you're together with your sisters and brothers and with God. In the name of our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.